Hello and welcome to Hot and Heavy, the Elaine Bennis podcast. I'm your host, Shivani Desai. Today I'll be talking about Season 6, Episode 21, The Diplomats Club. Hello everyone! I hope everyone out there is doing well. I'm doing fine. I'm just um, here in my closet. Oh, and I know you guys all want an update on my setup. I'm standing again. The standing setup seems to be working pretty well. Um, You know, I don't finish the show and have to struggle to get up because my legs have fallen asleep or my hips are just uh, screaming from being in uh, the crisscross applesauce position. (laughs) So I know this is you guys have been wondering. Um, it's so far so good. I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with this standing arrangement for a while. Ideally, I would love to like have a proper studio. Maybe one of these days. Maybe you know after hot and heavy finally blows up, and I'm getting guests from Seinfeld to be on my show. You know, and then we have a big finale episode with Miss Julia Louis Dreyfus. I want to have a nice studio at that point. You know, so. Guys, put that out there. Just just put those vibes out there for me. I also wanted to do a quick shout out. Do people say shout out anymore? Probably not. Um, but that's what I'm calling it. <laughs> a friend of mine who I used to see at the gym, Michelle, she was so sweet. And I apologize. I, I totally flaked on this uh, shout out for a few weeks. But Michelle let me know a few weeks ago. She messaged me and said, hey, I just wanted to let you know that my son listens to your podcast and he he really enjoys it. He really, you know, loves listening. So I wanted to give a shout out to Jonathan Lee and um, just give a big old podcast virtual hug to you and a thank you for listening and enjoying Hot and Heavy. I so appreciate it. And um, yeah, many more episodes to come. We have a lot more to cover in Seinfeld. I mean, seasons seven, eight, nine. I mean, there is just prime Seinfeld episodes coming up. So Jonathan, you have a lot to look forward to. And I hope I hope I uh, keep it going for you, your enjoyment of this show. <laughs> I'll keep you in mind, Jonathan, I don't want to I don't want to lose Jonathan Lee as a listener. So I gotta I gotta keep my game at a high level. So thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, to kind of, I don't I hate to turn it to something pretty morbid and sad. But This past week, I lost um, an aunt of mine who was pretty tragic, a pretty sudden death. It was kind of took the family by by surprise and shock. And we were, yeah, it still sort of doesn't feel real. But um, one of my aunts passed away this last week. She had a really bad fall and um, just didn't recover from that. So I just want to dedicate this this podcast episode to my aunt. Now she was my um, my mother's brother's wife, and in the Indian culture, we have different names for you know depending on how you're related to um, a person, you have sort of a different name that you call them. So her name first name was Nilima, and I call her my Nilima mommy because uh, she was married to my Madhu mama. So when it's your mom's brother. You say mama after his name, and then whoever he marries is your mommy. So this was my Neely Ma mommy who passed away. And man, I just, she she brightened every room she was in. She was just one of those, those spirits who, you know, just had a joy about her. And that is a lot of my memories with her. She lived in India. And um, but she visited both of her kids. My cousins live in the United States and have for for uh, over a couple decades now. And so, you know, she would visit quite often and she'd always stop in Detroit and see our family. And um, yeah, I just have every memory of her I have is just her smiling and laughing. And she was just one of those really joyful relatives that you looked forward to seeing, you know, um, whenever they came. And, And she really had an interest in you know, everyone's lives. And, and uh, she just she was just full of love. And I just feel like, man, this was not supposed to happen yet. And that's usually I think what people feel when someone's kind of snatched away in a tragic accident way too soon. But she did live a long life. And um, the one bright side, she she was visiting her son in Seattle, my cousin. And 
her daughter, who actually lives in Boston, my other cousin, just happened to be visiting. So the whole family, all of her grandchildren, her two kids, everyone was together. And they were there for her last moments. So in a weird way, in this tragedy, in in a situation that I feel still doesn't feel like it's fair or it should have happened, um, at least she was in the end surrounded by her kids and her grandkids. My uncle, her husband, passed away a few years back. So, um, you know, trying to look at the positive there. But I'd like to dedicate this episode to my Neely Mamami. All right, let's get into the episode. The synopsis for the Diplomats Club is as follows. While at an airport Diplomats Club, Kramer begins gambling with a Southern man over whether flights will arrive and depart on time. Jerry struggles to rendezvous with his girlfriend at a New York City airport after a particularly unsuccessful comedy set in another city. Elaine almost quits her job and then gets fired when she is wrongly accused of trying to kill Mr. Pitt. George tries to prove to his boss that he is not a racist. This episode was written by Tom Gamble and Max Pross. We start the episode out in Jerry's apartment. Jerry is on the phone with a woman, his girlfriend, and just kind of figuring out how much time they have before she leaves. And he says this weird line, I'll be the one without the big red sash. I I don't get it at all. But um, (laughs) Elaine sort of rolls her eyes. He gets off the phone. Elaine asks, was that the supermodel? And he says, yeah, she's leaving for a month, but I get six hours with her at the airport. I thought you had a show in Ithaca. He says, yes, it's an early show. And he's flying back the same day and meeting her at the Diplomats Club. Elaine changes the subject and says, guess what I'm doing today? I am quitting. Jerry can't believe it. That's it? You know, I never met the guy. And she says, you know, I've had enough, so I'm marching in. George enters. Jerry says, hey, Elaine's quitting. I'm marching in, she says. George says, wow, I've done that. Best feeling in the world. What about the march out? Not as good. (laughs) All right, Elaine's on her way out. Wish me luck. Get a march going. And George asks if he can borrow Jerry's camera because he wants to get a picture of him and his boss to put on his desk. (laughs) He says they're reorganizing the whole staff and he's on thin ice with this guy. Isn't putting a picture of you and him on your desk a little bit transparent? It better be, he says. <laughs> All right, my take on this scene. We are establishing what Elaine will be doing in the episode, you know, quitting her assistant job with Mr. Pitt. Now, first off, what I want to comment on is Elaine is in full riding gear. And it's not addressed. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't. There's nothing in the deleted scenes as well, or even in the in the notes about nothing. I, I was like, She's clearly in riding gear, like horseback riding gear. Now, we do know she grew up competing in equestrian competitions. Jerry says that when he's sort of making fun of her about interviewing moils in the bris. But at any rate, it's not a big deal. But um, she looks super cute in the horseback riding outfit. My my daughter rides horses. And I, I have to say, I love going to like those saddlery stores and looking at those cute outfits because every now and then we have to get her um, like the riding pants and stuff. But I do think like the whole section of those kind of equestrian formal outfits are it's like it's adorable and really stylish. I do not, however, like the prices. Holy shit, did my daughter pick a very expensive (laughs) hobby. (laughs) You couldn't have done like, I don't know, like volleyball or something. Um, Yeah, no. Horseback riding. It is not uh, it's not a cheap sport. I do really enjoy the energy here with the whole marching in. I'm marching. And I love that George and Jerry are genuinely excited for her and they're supporting her. It's kind of a rare moment of this friendship. So I like it. All right. Next, we are at Mr. Pitt's apartment. Elaine enters. She takes a deep breath and starts marching over to his desk. She says, I have something to tell you. And he stops her. He says, just a second. And she's like, Mr. Pitt. And he says, Elaine, I've amended my will to include you as a beneficiary. What? And he says, you know, I've come to think of you as a member of my family. You've become like a daughter to me. And he wants to make sure that she's taken care of after he's gone. Oh, Mr. Pitt. She is so touched. And he's like, oh, you know what? I feel a cold coming on. Can you get me a cold pill from the medicine cabinet? Oh, no, no, you mustn't, she says. You have to check with the pharmacist before you combine any medication with your heart medicine. Oh, yes, he says. I'll check with the pharmacist. We don't want anything happening to you. We want you to live a very long, long time. And she kisses him and gives him a hug. 
Uh, my take on this scene, it's fine. Um, I like the little switcheroo here. Elaine comes in with such a determined attitude and then it all changes with the news of Mr. Pitt's will. And it's very sweet. I like how touched she is in the moment. It seems very genuine, of course. I think it's also very sweet that Mr. Pitt thinks of her as a daughter. <laughs> no matter how much they fought or argued about little minute things and, uh, you know, just socks and, and sharpening pencils, getting salt off of pretzels. But yeah, I, I think it's a very sweet moment. And this scene also plants the seed about the whole medicine plot as well. All right, next we're in George's office. George is taking photos of the staff and then he notices he has one more photo left. How about me and Mr. Morgan? <laughs> I love it. Mr. Morgan couldn't be more annoyed. Why? Ah, oh, because we were a team, he says. So as George poses next to him, he says, has anyone ever told you you look a lot like Sugar Ray Leonard? What? <laughs> I'm sure you get that all the time. And Morgan says, I suppose we all look alike to you, huh, Costanza? And then click, that's when the photo's taken, right when George looks at him in horror. George tries to dig his way out. No, 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 this is not a racial thing. There really is a resemblance, right? And he tries to get all the other guys to back him up. But uh, yeah, they're not, uh, they're not helpful at all. They all walk out super embarrassed for George. All right, next we're at Monk's. Jerry's looking at the picture and he's like, eh, I guess he looks a little like Sugar Ray. And George thinks it's more than a little. Jerry's like, well, you still shouldn't have said it. George is so offended that Morgan thinks he's a racist. You know, he would have marched on Selma if it had been in Long Island. <laughs> Kramer enters to take Jerry to the airport. He says, oh, you have no luggage? He says, no, I'm just going for the day. You just need to stop by the drugstore to get a toothbrush. George shows Kramer the picture and asks, uh, who does this look like? He has no clue. Not salt, but what, Pepper Johnson? <laughs> no, Sugar Ray Leonard. Oh, no way. George is like, you know what? I bet out of the next three people, two of them will think that he looks like Sugar Ray Leonard. Well, Kramer gets fired up. How much? 200? 300? 1,000? And Jerry stops him, reprimands George. You know he shouldn't be betting, but it's a lock, Jerry. Kramer, you've had this under control for three years now, but it's a lock. No, he says. <laughs> anyway, Jerry's wondering what George is going to do about Morgan. George says, you know, he just needs to see me with some of my black friends. But you don't have any black friends. And outside of us, you don't have any white friends either. Great line. All right, next we are in a lobby of an apartment building. <laughs> George buzzes, and it turns out it's Joe Temple's building, the man who he had watched Breakfast at Tiffany's with in the couch episode. And Joe was like, who? <laughs> who is this? We watched Breakfast at Tiffany's together. What do you want? Well, I rented another movie, he says, and I brought some popcorn. Maybe they could do it again. Joe tells George to go away. The daughter, Remy, walks in and George stops her. I have another Audrey Hepburn movie. Joe, from the intercom, asks if that's Remy. Daddy, it's that man again. I want you up here instantly. So she scrambles to get into the building and slams the door in George's face. All right, next we are at the drugstore. Kramer of course, kicks over a display of pantyhose and Jerry's like, oh, that's great. He says he'll clean it up, just pull the car around and he gives Kramer his jacket to put in the car and Kramer exits. As he's cleaning up, Mr. Pitt approaches him and mentions, oh, I, I'm on heart medication, but I also have a runny nose. What should I take for that? So Jerry tells him where to find the antihistamines. It is all right to take them. Oh, yeah, they're great, Jerry says. What about appetite suppressants? And Jerry turns and finds him right next to him and hands him a box. Thank you, he says. Have a good day, sir. All right, real quick. Why is Mr. Pitt buying appetite suppressants? <laughs> this is never addressed. Like, we don't find out why he's doing this. I have a theory that the appetite suppressant is what causes the bad reaction with his heart medication, because maybe the antihistamines wouldn't do that. So just for technicality sake, or maybe even like legally, they couldn't have an antihistamine um, negatively affect him because of, you know, heart medication. So I bet there was something behind the scenes there. But I'm also like, why the hell is he taking appetite suppressants? <laughs> it's so weird. All right, next we're at the Diplomats Club. Kramer is impressed with how swanky it is, and Jerry's wondering where Katie is. Who's Katie? Ah, well, she's this woman who's been booking me on all these college tours, and she thinks I'm some big celebrity that has to be pampered and explained every little thing. Kramer says, oh, I'm going to go get some snacks before my flight. Then Katie enters. You found the airport all right? <laughs> yes, I followed the planes, Katie. 
Um, so then she lays into all the options for different coffee and what's going to be on the flight. There are going to be refreshments on the flight. And Jerry stops her. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for telling me. <laughs> so you see right away, like, she's very overbearing. The actress here is Deborah Jo Rupp. And... I, you know, no doubt this is one of the more recognizable guest stars of Seinfeld. Um, she, of course, goes on to play Kitty Foreman on that 70s show. She's been in a ton of shows and films. I loved her in Friends as Alice, <laughs> Frank's wife. But she's just, yeah, she's been in many things. She got her start in theater um, and comedy. I mean, she's just, she's done it all. And I always enjoy her. She is so good in everything she does. She just has that quality. She makes you comfortable when she's on screen. Um, And this episode is no exception. She makes me laugh in every scene she's in. She's just perfect as this overprotective manager agent type for Jerry. Uh, What a gift to have her on this episode. She is really great. And she will come back for one more episode of Seinfeld. All right, next we are in Mr. Pitt's bedroom. Mr. Pitt is in bed and being attended to by a doctor. Elaine enters concerned. What happened? Uh, A woman is there, Lenore, who is Mr. Pitt's estate lawyer, and she's handling Mr. Pitt's will. And she tells Elaine that when she arrived, she found Justin collapsed on the floor. (gasps) Oh, my God. Elaine is shocked. And Lenore asks who she is. And Mr. Pitt says, well, this is the girl I want added to my will. Oh, you're the assistant. Why weren't you here taking care of him? Elaine sort of guiltily explains, well, he'd given me the morning off. I did a little shopping. How did this happen? Elaine asks. The doctor explains that he took a very dangerous combination of his heart medication and other pills. Ah, Mr. Pitt, I told you to talk to the pharmacist. He says, well, I spoke to someone who worked there. Oh, I'm going to go call that pharmacy. Elaine is fired up and she exits. Lenore then asks Mr. Pitt, how well do you know her? The actress in this scene is Kim Zimmer. She plays Lenore and um, she is like the soap opera queen. Well, or one of them, I should say. Susan Lucci is my personal soap opera queen, but that's another story. Um, But anyway, Kim Zimmer, she has done over (laughs) her... I had to like look at this a couple of times. She's done over 2,000 episodes of soap opera television, mostly between Guiding Light and One Life to Live. And I remember her. My mom used to watch One Life to Live when I was little. And yeah, it was so fun that the name rung a bell. I knew I knew that she looked familiar. But when I said when I saw Kim Zimmer, I was like, oh, my gosh, I totally remember that name. She was like the consummate soap opera 80s actress. And I think she's great as Lenore. It's such a fun character to play. All this very suspicious, kind of accusatory. And what better training for this role than soap opera acting? But she also adds like a comedic twist to it. It's subtle, but it's there. I think it's a very, very fun performance by Kim Zimmer. Then my take on the scene as a whole, um, it's fine. You know, there's nothing really funny about it. Kim Zimmer, honestly, as Lenore, is probably the best part of the scene. And as I just said uh, a couple seconds ago, (laughs) Kim Zimmer adds, uh, you know, this comedic flavor to this scene. I love the way she asks, why weren't you here looking after him? Or actually before that, the way she's like, who are you? (laughs) She's just like automatically hates Elaine. We don't know why. She just does. Um, And she suspects Elaine of wrongdoing before there's really any reason to suspect her of anything. I mean, it's fair. Elaine had the morning off, lady. Relax. But I suppose that's because she's an estate lawyer and her job is to make sure that Mr. Pitt isn't getting, you know, taken advantage of or including anyone in his will with ill intentions. So I guess I guess it all makes sense. But um, yeah, I th- for sure, Kim Zimmer's performance is sort of the highlight of the comedy in this scene. All right. Next, we're on the airplane. Katie and Jerry are seated and she starts explaining, you know, how they're going <laughs> to give us some instructions in the event of a crash. Jerry's like, yeah, I've flown before. Oh, good, because I didn't want you to freak out, she says. And goes on to explain the chances of a crash are very slim. Do you have to go to the bathroom? Jerry says no, but he knows what's coming any second. And sure enough, she starts in, because even if you have to go a little, you better go now because you won't get another chance until well after takeoff. (laughs) Jerry just runs to the back of the plane. Next, we're at the Diplomats Club. Kramer introduces himself to a businessman, Earl Haffler. And Kramer is amazed by the airport, and Earl disagrees. They're all morons. And he says, I bet you that flight to Pittsburgh takes off before my flight to Houston. And Kramer's like, no, no, no. Oh, come on, friendly wager. Pass the time. (sighs) Kramer caves and says, you're on, cowboy. All right, next we're on the street. (laughs) 
<laughs> George approaches a newsstand at the same time as a black man approaches. And uh, yeah, of course, that's what George notices. And he starts up a conversation. How you doing? Okay. Nice day today. What? I'm George. George Costanza. You live around here? And the man just ignores him, pays for his paper and walks away. Back at the Diplomats Club, Earl and Kramer are awaiting announcements, and turns out Earl wins with Mexico City. Seems like Kramer's lost a few times, and he wants to go again. Next, we are in Mr. Pitt's bedroom. Elaine asks him, do you need anything? He says no. He's trying to kind of sit up. She says, oh, you need to sit up a little bit. I'm going to go get you a pillow. So she gets one from the chair on the other side of the room, and by the time she turns back around, he's fast asleep. So as she's tiptoeing towards him with a pillow in hand, Lenore comes out of, I think, the bathroom. And of course, once again, looks very suspiciously at Elaine's stance with the pillow. Elaine turns around and sees her and waves and smiles. Uh, My take on this scene, eh, it's nothing much to it. Funny setup here to make Elaine look like she's about to smother Mr. Pitt. And again, it's Kim Zimmer's reaction that gets the laugh. All right, next, we are at the Ithaca Civic Auditorium. Jerry and Katie are backstage, and she's telling him, oh, it's a full house out there. The lighting guy's named Lou, and his birthday is next week. Jerry's like, I I don't care. By the way, Jerry, she says, I don't want you to freak out, but the pilot is in the audience. Who? Remember the plane we took here? The pilot is going to be sitting out there watching the show. Jerry's so irritated. Why are you telling me this? I just didn't want you to freak out when you saw him. Why would I freak out? (laughs) So Jerry gets introduced and he goes out on stage and he starts in on his set, but then he spots the pilot and totally freezes. Then we see a quick scene where George is trying to help a black man with his grocery bag, but the guy just swats him away. (laughs) George is trying so hard. All right, back at the show, we're backstage again. Jerry comes off stage to very tepid applause. Katie's like, that didn't go so well, did it? And he says, no. And you know why? That pilot really freaked me out. And that if she hadn't mentioned anything, he'd been fine. (laughs) Katie's like, when he asked to come to the show, I should have said no. I'm going to go chew him out. And Jerry says, well, it makes no difference now. Nope, Katie says, and she is on top of this and exits. All right, next, back at the Diplomats Club. Uh Uh-oh, Kramer's in deep. He owes Earl $3,200. Come on, one more bet, double or nothing. Okay, Earl says, but I want to see some cash. So Kramer calls Newman, tells him what's going on. Newman is so disappointed in him. And he's like, I don't have that kind of dough. Oh, yes, you do. Not the bag. Come on, man, I'm desperate. And Newman agrees. All right, next we're on the airplane, and Jerry and Katie are waiting for the plane to take off when the pilot comes on and says that there is a slight complication causing a delay. Jerry's getting impatient. What is the complication? So a flight attendant comes over and says that the pilot has asked for Jerry to leave the flight. It turns out that Katie really let him have it. He had no right being in your audience if you didn't want him to be. So Jerry is trying to convince the flight attendant he's not a disturbance. Well, apparently you are disturbing the pilot, sir. So Jerry reaches his limit and he starts freaking out. The actress in this scene playing the flight attendant is Christine Cattell. She is a former Miss Canada contestant representing Toronto. I think she's great in this scene. You know, she's got that constant smile throughout all of the dialogue, telling Jerry some pretty upsetting news. But yeah, the smile throughout is really funny. Next, we're at an airport gate where Jerry's been kicked out. Um, Katie says, there's flights at 8 o'clock and 8.30. Which one? Which one do you think I want? He says, the one that gets back earlier. Then she asks about a hotel because the flights are actually in the morning. No, no, he says, I need to get back tonight. And he tells her, go rent a car. Mid-sized luxury or sports model, what's your preference? Jerry's had it. I don't have a preference. Just make a decision yourself, okay? Stop bothering me with every minor detail. Katie's a little hurt by that. Okay, you're the big celebrity. And Jerry calls George because he needs someone to go to the Diplomats Club to meet his girlfriend, Bridget. But George, of course, has got a one-track mind at this point. He asks about that exterminator he used. Carl from Defend? Why? Oh, because he's black? (laughs) Yes, that's the reason. And he hangs up on Jerry. All right, next we're at Mr. Pitt's place. Lenora answers a call from Jerry asking for Elaine, and she enters the main room and finds Elaine reading Fatal Vision. She tells her she has a phone call from Jerry Seinfeld. 
Elaine answers, and Jerry is in full freakout mode, tells her she needs to go to the Diplomats Club to meet Bridget to tell her he'll be late. He'll never get another date with her. That's at the airport, right? So Lenore is in the background listening to this entire conversation. Well, I guess Elaine's portion of the conversation where she's saying things like, calm down, I'll take care of it. I said I'll take care of it. And once again, we see Lenore's very suspicious face. Uh, My take on the scene, I feel like a broken record here, but JLD doesn't really get too much comedy. She's just having a conversation with Jerry. And once again, Kim Zimmer gets to make faces in the background, which is amusing. All right, next we are at the Diplomats Club. Newman arrives with the mailbag and presents it to Kramer, who then shows Earl, who doesn't get it at first. And then he sees it's the bag of David Berkowitz, the son of Sam, the worst serial killer the post office has ever produced. Okay, they're back in business and they decide to bet Ithaca versus Boston double or nothing. All right, next we're in a car where Katie is driving and (laughs) Jerry's asleep and then wakes up. He finds that Katie's not even on a road. She's totally lost. Oh, we lost the road a while ago. Why didn't you wake me up? He says. You told me not to bother you with minor details. No road is a major detail, he says. Should I keep going or turn around? Do you have a preference? Look out! And we hear a crash sound. All right, next we're at George's office. Carl the exterminator arrives with no equipment or uniform on, per George's instructions. And George welcomes him. Carl, right? He's like, do I know you? Yes, you fumigated my friend Jerry Seinfeld's apartment for fleas. Seinfeld. Oh, funny white guy, right? (laughs) Huh, I guess he is white, George says. You know, he doesn't really see people in terms of color. Well, anyway, he wants uh, Carl to meet someone and he calls for Mr. Morgan. But turns out he's left for dinner. Huh. Carl, you hungry? All right, next we're in Mr. Pitt's bedroom. He and Lenore are watching television and on the news... They see a story about Jerry's car crash into a pool. (laughs) Comedian Jerry Seinfeld seemed a little freaked out. And then we see Jerry saying, no more questions, and trying to escape from the camera into some bushes. Mr. Pitt recognizes him as the man in the pharmacy who said it was okay to mix his drugs. And Lenore says, Jerry Seinfeld. (gasps) Someone named Jerry Seinfeld called earlier for Elaine. And they look at each other in shock. All right, next we're in a restaurant where Mr. Morgan is eating dinner. Carl and George enter, and uh, George tells Carl, you just act like we're old friends. They find Morgan, and, well, Morgan, per usual, doesn't seem excited to see George at all. And he introduces him to Carl, an old friend of mine. I'm the exterminator. Yeah, that's what we used to call him in high school. He's a linebacker. And George pulls up two chairs to join Mr. Morgan. All right, back at the Diplomats Club, Kramer has won the bet and Earl is giving him traveler's checks. Elaine arrives and tells him what happened with Jerry's flight from Ithaca. Earl's ears perk up. What about the flight from Ithaca? She says, oh, our stupid friend freaked out the pilot and single-handedly delayed the flight an hour. You're a cheat, Earl says. He thinks Kramer scammed him. And he snatches his money back and exits. And Bridget enters as he leaves. The actress who plays Bridget is Berta Wagfjord, and there aren't a lot of credits to her name. (laughs) And I really don't have anything to say about her performance. She's super pretty and definitely looks like a supermodel. She also appeared in Attack of the 50-Foot Woman, uh, which starred Daryl Hannah um, in 1993. And it also has 3.5 stars on IMDb. So uh, moving on. Next, we're in Mr. Pitt's bedroom. Elaine's there, and she's so confused. Jerry Seinfeld trying to poison you? What? Mr. Pitt, what are you, delirious? He's never even met you. You're fired, Elaine, he says. Goodbye. What? We see a montage of scenes with Elaine and Mr. Pitt that's happened this season over an instrumental score of The Way We Were. (laughs) And we come back to Elaine in tears. Uh, My take on this scene... It's a funny scene, mostly because of the over-dramatized montage and really nothing else. Also, I have to mention this. Why the hell is Lenore there all the live long day? (laughs) Like Mr. Pitt has had like a medical episode. He needs to rest and she's just like hanging out in his bedroom with him. What the hell? She's his estate lawyer. (laughs) There's no reason she should be hanging out all day. It's very bizarre. I feel like they could have explained it a little bit, like maybe, like, no, no, don't leave, Lenore, we'll have to go over my will. Like, maybe he's like, 
hey, as soon as I rest, like, let's just get this done. But yeah, it's just bizarre to me that she's there the entire day, like into the night. <laughs> All right. In the last scene of the episode, we are at the Diplomats Club. Bridget is sitting alone and Jerry arrives all disheveled. Jerry, what happened? Oh, he's so sorry. He got stuck out of town and missed most of their time together. Well, turns out she does have a half an hour. So they go over to a conference room and start making out. A plane is pulling up out the window that they're near. And, uh, oh, who does Jerry see? It's the pilot! The pilot! There is a tag to the episode at the dinner with (laughs) Morgan, George, and Carl. And George says, oh, he loves this restaurant. And tells Morgan that he and Carl come here all the time. And Carl agrees. You wouldn't believe the rat problem in the kitchen. (laughs) It causes George to spit out all his food. And Morgan gets so mad. So you are an exterminator. You've sunk to a new low, Costanza. And he exits in a huff. George, totally defeated, motions over to the waiter for the check. And the waiter comes over and says, hey, Sugar Ray Leonard can eat here on the house. And George freaks out and starts chasing after Morgan. All right, I'm going to take a quick break and I will see you on the other side. Are you in need of personal management? I'm not talking about occasional phone calls or quarterly messages. I'm talking about real, hands-on, and sometimes overwhelming attention to your career needs. Well, I'm your gal. I'm Katie, and I can handle anything, as long as you let me know your preference. I have worked with many professionals during my career, from famous comedians to high school principals. No matter what you do for a living, Katie can help make sure things get a little bit easier if that's what you prefer. My services include scheduling, accompanying you to events, explaining very straightforward airplane procedures, and confronting anyone who wrongs you. I have no tolerance for unprofessionalism, demanding pilots, Rick James, or decision-making autonomy. Call me now to book Katie's Management Services at 555-YOU-TELL-ME. And depending on what you want and your preferences, we can figure out how I can best manage your needs. Katie's Management Services. I don't want to freak you out. Katie of Katie's Management Services is not legally permitted to drive her clients any distance for any reason. And we're back. There weren't any extras of note, so I'm going to move on to Greg's sack lunch. Now, Greg is our most loyal contributor to this podcast, and every week he sends us a sack lunch full of his thoughts. Okay, the first thing I find in Greg's sack are his overall thoughts. He says, this is a rare type of episode for me. And the reason is, of all of the storylines happening, Kramer's is actually the most interesting in my opinion. I love that we get to see that he actually has a gambling problem and how he grapples with it, even though both Jerry and Newman try to intervene. Elaine's story is sort of given the least amount here, even though her time with Mr. Pitt coming to an end should be more juicy. Oh my gosh, I could not agree more, Greg. Yeah, Elaine's storyline is bleh. And given that it marks the ending of her relationship with Mr. Pitt, we deserved more. I cannot agree. I don't love the whole Diplomats Club stuff. In my opinion, George's storyline is the most entertaining to me. Like I and Jerry's because I do love Katie. I love Deborah Jo Rupp as Katie. So fantastic. So yeah, out of all of them, I definitely wouldn't pick Kramer's storyline as my favorite, but um, I certainly wouldn't pick Elaine's either. All right, next in Greg's sack are his favorite scenes and Elaine moments. He says, Elaine and Mr. Pitt's relationship has always been a hilarious one and where he is both domineering and also lovable. When he says he's putting her in his will, she does a 180 from being ready to quit to being so touched she has to stay. While this is endearing and almost moving, there really isn't a ton of comedy in this plot. The nosy lawyer lady is very one-dimensional, and you can tell where this is going right away. That said, my favorite Elaine moment is when she is going to give Mr. Pitt an extra pillow, and this lawyer walks in, and Elaine smiles and waves. The implication is it looks like she's about to smother him, but Elaine would never do that. Yes, um, you know... That's a good point. That is a good that is a good moment. I like how she like mouths. Hi, Lenore. (laughs) Like, it's so weird. But 
You're right. Yeah, Kim Zimmer's performance is very one-dimensional, but that's all she has to do in this in this really weak-ass plot. So, I don't know. It's like the one part of the plot that makes me laugh is just kind of her looking at Elaine. What's she doing? <laughs> but yeah, it gets old real quick. I can I can definitely admit that. Greg goes on to say, I also do love Elaine crying after Mr. Pitt fires her so coldly, and we see the little montage of their time together. She was ready to move on anyway, but it's endearing that she thought only positively of it in that moment. Um, Yeah, I, I hate saying I don't like JLD's performance, but it's supposed to be comical. She's not supposed to really be crying. I mean, if she was really like crying, it might look a little bit overdone, but... I don't like that little shot of her after the montage. It's just, it's so fakey crying, but whatever. I forgive it. It's not like I'm, I'm, you know, bashing her performance. But uh, yeah, it's the over-dramatized montage is the funniest part for me in that scene. All right, Greg's scene swap. He says, because this episode is sort of four stories very loosely overlapping, it's hard to say what I change because I don't love any of it too much to begin with. I'd have played up the Elaine and Mr. Pitt breakup more and ditched George's avoidance of being perceived as a racist altogether. Instead of having Jerry be the one as co-conspirator in Elaine's alleged plot to kill Mr. Pitt, they already were talking about Newman taking over the son of Sam's mail route. This would have been a funnier tie-in to make the lawyer think Elaine was a killer by having her hear Elaine saying, the son of Sam, on the phone, as if this was all much more sinister. Have it be Kramer talking to Mr. Pitt in the pharmacy instead of Jerry. The way they chose to do it was sloppy to me. Oh, that's interesting. I like those little shifts. Yeah, I think somehow tying in the son of Sam thing, like maybe Elaine needs to pick up David Berkowitz's bag and bring it to Kramer. Yeah, maybe she's the savior for um, for Kramer. Uh, yeah, I definitely, you know, like I already said, I really like George's storyline. <laughs> and I'll get more into that later. But yeah, I wouldn't ditch that at all. Uh, and I actually don't have a scene swap idea for this episode. I just think I think my scene swap is basically make Elaine's departure from Mr. Pitt more uh, juicy, as you said. Um, that's all. That's all I have to say about that. All right. And finally, in Greg Sack are his extra thoughts. He says, all of my gripes about this episode aside, Deborah Jo Rupp cracks me up as Jerry's manager. She's totally the opposite kind of person he would have on his team. So the whole premise is funny, yet somehow it gets lost in this episode. Yeah, I agree. I do love her performance. It is so just her and Jerry together, the combination of the both of them. I mean, everything she does, like even the little at when they're backstage and he's like, why would I freak out? And she just kind of does this like thing with her fists. And she's like, I don't know why I said that. Like, she's so, so good. I, as I said before, I love everything I've seen Deborah Jo Rupp in. She is, she's just got this such a sweet, like, charm to her and she's really really funny in everything she's she's done so I wasn't a huge gosh it's so funny when I think about that 70s show back in college I definitely like made a point to watch it every week like I remember me and my roommates like oh it's that 70s show is on like we'd watch it and I do remember her making such an impact because truth be told I never really liked a lot of the actors who played the kids like sorry Ashton Kutcher Mila Kunis Topher Grace. Um, (laughs) But I thought the parents were always super funny. And of course, she played um, Kitty Foreman. But I agree. Deborah Jo Rupp kind of saves the episode, in my opinion, Um, along with all of the black guys (laughs) that George is trying to befriend. Like, I love Joe Temple. I love the guy at the newsstand. Just like, what? (laughs) Like, he's so annoyed. (laughs) I'll get more into it at the end of the episode, so I won't I won't bore you with it now. But yeah, George's storyline to me is probably the best one in the entire episode. So we we disagree sometimes, Greg, and you know that's what that's what uh, happens. Even when we're both huge fans of the show, we're never going to see eye to eye a hundred percent of the time, and that's okay. But I do thank you for sending in your thoughts, and now it's time to close Greg's sack lunch. All right, now moving on to my favorite Elaine moments. Woof, not much to choose from, but it's probably that first scene. All the marching in energy. I like that. And her outfit's super cute. All right, my final notes for the episode. There are a lot of fun things about this episode, but unfortunately, 
It's not a strong Elaine episode where JLD gets to play with too much comedy. I like her plot. I like this whole quitting plot. But the laughs really come from Mr. Pitt and Lenore. But I mean, it is a big deal. This episode marks the end of Elaine and Mr. Pitt's relationship. So it's significant in the Elaine arc and it's entertaining. But it's just, you know, the comedy really didn't lie with JLD. She didn't have a lot to play with here. I did want to mention really quick how the whole racial thing with George, I thought I think it's a very clever way for the show to call themselves out about the lack of diversity. I mean, I don't think they were doing it for that reason. And nor did they do anything differently after this. But I I really think it's clever to kind of call out themselves like that. Like I said, that line is so fantastic. We don't have any black friends. And outside of us, you don't really have any white friends either. So it's called out like, hey, we're just a white, bunch of white people that hang out with white people. <laughs> and that, you know, the racism thing isn't isn't portrayed like, oh, these are just angry black men accusing George. No, it's like it's very fair. And yeah, we see George say something like, don't fucking say that, man. Like, you don't (laughs) don't tell a black man he looks like some famous black man because and I'll say this as an Indian person, too, like you always get compared to whatever one or two Indian or black or whatever minority person that person happens to know. I always look like everyone's Indian friend from high school that they grew up with. And like, and granted, I don't know what they look like. And maybe I am a carbon copy of them. But most of the time, it's like, oh, you're an Indian person. You remind me of my other Indian friend. So I just like that they call that out in this episode. I do think his intentions are good. But it's that overcorrection sometimes that Uh, people tend to do when they're like, oh, I really have to prove I'm not like this. And I think that's (laughs) all I can say about the Diplomats Club. Please be sure to follow Hot and Heavy on Instagram and TikTok. On Instagram, it's at Hot Heavy Elaine. And on TikTok, it's at Elaine Bennis Podcast. And if you'd like to email me thoughts, please do at ElainePodcast at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you next time.